My name is Eric Kekiel. I'm a professor here and helping to uh, coordinate the uh, Urban Growth Seminar Series this semester. And this is a session that I've really been excited about and looking forward to uh, since last semester, actually, when I first met uh, Dr. Buchenbach on a plane as we were on our, both on our way to Brazil and uh, fell into conversation with him and became fascinated uh, both by his background, which is quite an extraordinary uh, career, but also his current work uh, in providing uh, solar power here in California. Um, it, briefly, his background, he's from uh, Germany originally, as is one of our discussants, uh, so, and um, arrived here, did a PhD at Caltech, uh, focusing on physics and astronomy and uh, related topics, then was hired off into McKinsey where he did consulting and uh, ended up on Wall Street doing finance deals, decided he would like things that were more tangible. I hope I remember our conversation well, uh, and went into real estate. And from that then moved into uh, producing solar power, which combines all of these elements, right? Combines the physics, the energy, the, the, uh, the real estate development, the financial side of it. So uh, it's all coming together. And he does this work both here in the U US, especially in California, as well as uh, other places around the world. So it's really fascinating. And uh, I believe this is your first time to speak at the University of Southern California. And so it's our great pleasure to, to welcome you here. And because it's such a great speaker we have, we decided we're going to have to have two discussants to, uh, to uh, sort of wrestle them to the ground. Uh, and one of whom is my colleague, <laughs> Daniel von Winterfeld, um, who also, as I mentioned, uh, hails from Germany and is the uh, professor both here in the Price School and in the Viterbi uh, School of Engineering. Uh, and is the founding director and repeat director now of CREATE, the Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorist Events. And our second discussant, our other discussant, is Ms. Bonnie Rice, who many of you know as uh, global director for the Schwarzenegger Institute here uh, at the Price School, and uh, who is been very energetic in bringing the values of the Schwarzenegger Institute and helping to infuse that into many aspects of our activities here at the Price School, and especially as it relates to students and to research and to workshops. And she herself um, has uh, really focused a lot, in addition to energy issues, on uh, education and held the portfolio of uh, Secretary for Education in the state of California uh, under the Schwarzenegger um, uh, administration. So we have a, a, wonderful, a wonderful lineup and so the best thing I can do is get out of the way and let it, let it begin. I just had a conversation about, I want to say four days ago, with a top executive of a large power plant developer um, in the US, traditional power plants, gas-fired power plants. And um, we also were on an airplane coming back. And, um, and he said, we just scrapped all of our plans to build gas-fired power plants in Texas. And I'm like, what's the reason? He said, solar is going to kill us. We can't make money anymore. Now, Texas, unlike California, which you may know, you know, treats environmental perks a little differently, um, to put it mildly. Um, California, there's been a lot of renewable energy. A lot of it was, you know, twist my arm. You know, we want certain renewable portfolio, portfolio standards, et cetera. So um, um, there was a lot of development early on. Texas, there's none of that. Um, the renewable energy credits in Texas are near worthless. Um, in Texas, we're competing on price, and he's competing on price, and he knows he can't win anymore. What, what this presentation is about, um, 
is the energy industry, and Detlef may appreciate that, you know, which is a major driver of a lot of stuff that's going on in the world, from you know, oil, don't want to say we fight war over oils, but certainly been a major, major piece of the equation. Um, the energy industry in the world is fundamentally changing over the next, call it 20 years. What's fascinating is this is something we can see ahead of us, or at least some of us do. Typically, when you hear about these revolutions that happen, they're always in the rear mirror. It's like, you know, when the PC came, you know, when, when Apple came up with a PC and, you know, they had the idea everybody will have a PC and people wondered what the hell would I need a computer in my home for, et cetera. You know, so in hindsight, we all say, wow, that was a complete revolution. You know, how fascinating, how that totally changed everything and nobody really saw it coming. Well, this one we see coming. So you can be a spectator for the next 20, 30 years to see how the energy markets are fundamentally changing in this world. <clears throat> the title is a little boring. Um, talks about power plants and all of that. So I wanted to just put that into perspective. So one of the key ingredients, and, and this is rather boring factual, but one of the key ingredients for you know, what you would call a revolution um, which really isn't when you talk about 20 or 30 years. This you know, doesn't happen tomorrow morning, suddenly there's a new government in place or something. Um, this is a slow, more of an evolution, but very disruptive in its, in its impacts, is that it needs to be a proven technology, it needs to be financeable, photovoltaic, and this is what I'm talking about, photovoltaic panels, and maybe just for reference, it's the panels you see down there, it's the same stuff you would put on your roof, a lot of people ask me, oh, you're in solar, so do you guys install rooftop solar systems? This is about large-scale power plants powering the entire economy and industry. So it's very important that the technology is very mature before you can have a revolution that actually really is scalable. Um, PV certainly is that. Um, it, it's estimated that by 2035, there will be about $1.3 trillion invested in photovoltaics. It's a huge number worldwide. Um, maybe taking a step back where we are kind of globally, if you think about the ages here, um, there was the age of coal, um, then we kind of entered the age of oil, where, where oil is now, or used to be, still is, you know, one of the major sources of energy. Now we're in the age of gas, more or less, today. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that is, that is about to change. But, you know, make no mistake, there's a lot more gas-fired power plants than there are solar power plants today. Um, and there will be for quite a while. Um, but I think the next thing coming is the age of renewables. And they will start taking over in terms of the energy mix. Nothing is very quick in this field. It's a very you know, big investments that take a long time um, to, be, to be built and to be amortized. But l we are going to transition pretty much completely out of coal in the next 50 years, call it. Um, gas is going to stay with us for probably quite a while. And renewables in various forms are taking over. There's, you know, there's obviously solar, but there's also other renewables. So <clears throat> um, the United States is in a very unique position for this revolution, because this technology, as I said earlier, you have, to be, you have to be able to finance it. Financing in the US is very easy. It's a very you know, good country to do large project development in. We also happen to be in one of the best places on the planet in terms of solar radiation. Um, deserts with, with uh, very dry air, um, very predictable weather patterns, etc. And that dark spot there is somewhere around Kern County. Um, this is one of the best places in, in the world um, to deploy this technology. Um, just to give you an idea of how powerful the sun is. If you took a 30 by 30 mile square in the middle of Texas, which Texas is a good
good solar place, not the greatest, um, but it's, it's pretty good, that receives enough energy to power the entire United States. Okay, that 30 by 30 miles square. Forget about everything from oil, gas, coal, nuclear. That square receives enough energy to power the entire United States. That's a pretty small little square. Now, you'd have to use today's technology to actually turn that into electricity that we can use. And with today's technology, that would be about a 75 by 75 mile square. I think those graphics are a little big. That's actually a lot more than 75 miles on there. Um, in an airplane, that would take you 10 minutes to fly over. So you, you know, you barely notice it down there. And you go like, well, why aren't we doing it? Well, you know, little details like transmission, you need to get the energy out. And we're probably not going to build one big power plant because Detlef would have a hard time with that. Um, but that just shows how incredibly powerful the sun actually is. But it also shows we actually don't use really a lot of energy. That's the good news. You know, we always think of ourselves as energy hogs. We're actually using a tiny amount of energy compared to what the sun can provide. So that's really good news. This problem is very solvable. <coughs> If you look at energy prices, and I'm not going to bore you with the details here, solar has been coming down continuously. And this is my favorite slide. This is what drove me and my business partner seven years ago into this business. This is the cost to produce electricity from a solar photovoltaic panel. That chart starts in 1978. So that's coming up on nearly 40 years. So this is nothing new. The cost of photovoltaic power generation has come down for 40 years on a more or less steady curve. It's about 7% per year. So you can see this train coming. But 20 years ago, nobody cared because you know, it was up there somewhere where it was just not anywhere near competitive with, with fossil fuels. It took until just maybe five, 10 years ago when it started becoming interesting in terms of, hey, I can start competing with retail rates, which is when you put it on your rooftop and you don't pay the utility, you kind of pay yourself. Not a real competition in the sense that you know it's retail versus actual power generation. But nevertheless, um, it started becoming interesting in the power markets. Today, we're below wholesale natural gas. What that means, wholesale natural gas, means a big gas-fired power plant. We beat them. But the trend continues. There's no reason why this curve will stop. This is a Moore's-like law. It's not exactly Moore's law. But photovoltaics is a chip technology. And if you think about your, your little camera chip, you know, I remember 10 years ago, I bought a 256 megabyte camera chip, and I was amazed I could take like 100 pictures. And you know, with that chip today, they give them away for free at trade shows. Um, you know, that is, it's the same principal technology. It's a silicon chip. They get better, faster, and cheaper all the time. There is no stopping. This is not a conventional way of producing power, like nuclear, which is you know, a bunch of concrete and steel and turbines and stuff. That stuff gets more expensive, and they have to pay for security. Um, or, or gas, fired power plants. That's all conventional stuff. At the end of the day, gas is you know, labor, getting the gas out of the ground, and equipment to transport it, pipelines, et cetera. That's all conventional stuff. This is a computer chip technology. And it's on a cost curve like computer chips are. They just get better, faster, and cheaper all the time. That is why this is a revolution. That is what makes this technology very different from any other energy technology. Maybe you know geothermal or wind or whatever not. You know, this is a totally different ballgame. You can imagine what that chart does if you were in the business of running or building gas-fired power plants, and you look at that chart. You know, that's not pretty. How am I going to compete with that? It's like the steam engine guys trying to compete with you know, gasoline engines. It's like 
game over. I mean, this is, you know, not a question of if, it's only a question of when, you know. This doesn't stop, and this will completely change the energy industry worldwide. If you look at, on the left side, you have all the conventional, everything from nuclear to, to natural gas, coal, diesel, a lot of places in the world, you know, smaller island nations or, you know, various places that don't have the cheap coal. Um, they use heavy oils. Natural gas is only very cheap in, in the U.S. It's still pretty pricey in, in Europe. Mostly comes from our friend Putin. Um, so uh, the Europeans scratch their heads how much they like that dependency on it. Um, all of that stuff over time goes up in cost. Now there's fluctuations, you know, oil is very cheap right now, but you know, five years from now, who knows? But you know, um, because it is effectively labor and supply and demand driven, it goes up in cost over time because supplies diminish or it gets more expensive to get to more reservoirs. On the other hand, solar just keeps on getting cheaper. So for different countries at different times, depending on what fuels you're using, you're somewhere on that equation where you have the break even. Break even doesn't mean I immediately shut down my coal plant and build a solar plant, right? I mean, I got the sunk cost, so I'm gonna run that coal plant for another 20 years. Um, but I'm not gonna build a new coal plant. So I'm gonna replace that. And now if you're in a country like Brazil, that, well, Brazil is not a good example. Um, take Bangladesh. Bangladesh, 7% GDP growth a year. Had it for the last 10 years. So, you know, their economy, you know, half the stuff you buy at the Gap comes out of Bangladesh. Um, they need more energy every day, you know. So they're not thinking about replacing coal plants. They're thinking about, I need more power plants. Um, interestingly enough, places like Colombia. Um, Colombia is, has very cheap power today. So you'd say, ah, oh, that's probably not a good good opportunity. Why is that? Well, they have hydro. They have a lot of hydro. Well, they're tapped out. They've built a dam wherever, you know, it's reasonably feasible to build a dam. And in um, Brazil, by the way, the same issue. Um, Brazil has 80% of their power comes from hydro. Because of climate change, they're now, for the last 10 years, they've had declining hydro generation. They're just running out of water. And so they're scrambling um, to figure out how are we going to power our country and how are we going to power our economic growth once you know government issues are slightly resolved in Brazil. Um, but uh, um, just because power is really cheap in a country doesn't mean that the incremental megawatt hours you want to add to the grid um, aren't very cost competitive. Uh, Colombia, for example, is burning oil. They're building oil-fired power plants, and you go like, Jesus Christ, you know, that is really bad, you know, really expensive. Even at $35 a barrel, it's still a very expensive way. Well, they used to have a deal with Hugo Chavez, and, you know, they got the oil at a subsidy. That deal is over now, so they're screwed. <laughs> so they're struggling. What are we doing? They're all looking at solar. They're also looking at wind, which is very cheap. The other factor that a lot of people ignore is it's not just about cost. Right? This is the cost of a million BTU for natural gas at the Henry Hub, which is one of the big trading, trading hubs in the US. Um, today, natural gas is really cheap at about $2 a million BTU. That's not inflation adjusted. So the inflation adjusted, this is about as cheap as it's ever been. But it was up at $16 on peak, actually. Well, doesn't show the peaks, but um, it's, been, it's been in the mid to high teens um, at times. Uh, actually, just a winter ago, one year ago, it was at $5. It peaked for you know, a week or two and then came back down. Um, the point of this is it's not just about cost today. It's about volatility, right? I'm trying to build an economy like in Colombia, and I build oil-fired power plants, power plants because I have a sweet deal with Hugo and then Hugo dies and then I'm screwed. And now I'm back to world market prices for oil and I can't afford it. 
Same is true in, in, in the US. Uh, utilities are still right now thinking about, oh, we should build more gas-fired power plants because the stuff is so damn cheap. Well, 10 years, it's not. We just signed and got approval last week for a power contract with Los Angeles Department of Water, our third one with them, um, for 5.2 cents a kilowatt hour, fixed for 30 years. Inflation adjusted, that's three and a half cents per kilowatt hour. That is coal prices. Three and a half cents in today's dollars. And I can guarantee that price for 30 years. <coughs> Gas guy can't do that. Gas guy goes, well, I don't know, idea in five years, you know, wherever, you know, there's a big gas accident and then, you know, a uh, bunch of EPA requirements and it's going to drive prices up. Right now, gas supply is actually diminishing because less drilling and then and the non-shale gas is, is reducing about 5% per year in the U.S. We're slowly running out of non-shale gas and then there's all this shale gas that, that, that it costs about three bucks uh, to get the shale gas out of the ground. So none of these guys are making money right now. They're all hurting, which is why nobody's investing in gas right now. So gas supply is diminishing. So gas prices will go up. That's the expectation. 20 years from now, they have no idea what gas prices will be. I mean, it's completely unknown. Um, so um, volatility in terms of if you build an economy or grow your economy or even you know, have a steady state economy, um, is, is a huge factor in terms of planning. I don't want to build you know, a data center, which by the way, data centers now, we, we start um, writing big contracts with, with companies that run big data centers. They want that 20, 30 year forward visibility of not having any shocks because they use a lot of electricity. They're starting to settle in desert areas where there's a lot of solar because the solar guys are the only ones that can give them a steady contract. I can sign a 30-year contract. My fuel cost is zero. My, you know, I'm not subject to any of these volatilities. I can do that. All I have to do is pay back the bank, and weather patterns are uh, certainly in desert areas extremely predictable. So now for the rest of the world, if you look at this, about 80% of the world's population live in Sunbelt countries. It's not a surprise because that's where food grows, right? You know, who wants to live in the Arctic? <laughs> um, so where the sun shines is, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where the sun shines is where the population is. So, um, and look at that. This, the U.S. is not even considered a solar a sun belt country. So solar, you know, while it may not be a great solution in Alaska, certainly is a good solution for most of the world's population. You can see the growth, which countries, where it's growing up, um, investments. I'm not going to go into that. Um, this is more investments. Um, this is more technical, the duck chart. You guys probably could care less about. You know, this is some of the worries that folks have, you know, which is, is there going to be overgeneration of solar? And what do you do with that? And how about storage? You know, um, the sun doesn't shine at night. So you know, how is that going to work? Uh, all kinds of good questions, um, and there's good answers for that. Um, um, this is the answer here for storage. Storage technology, too, is getting cheaper. It's not quite a Moore's law, um, but for storage, it's mostly just because of scale. Right? I mean, a Tesla battery today is $500 per kilowatt hour, which is I still don't know why they're actually so relatively inexpensive, but still, relatively speaking, too expensive. Tesla is building the Gigafactory in Nevada. I'm sure you heard about that. Um, to build batteries at a huge scale, and just the scale will drive the cost of battery technology down. We're right now designing power plants with storage that will come online in 2018 to 2020, and our costs, including storage, is competitive with gas-fired power plants at that point. The solar PV is much cheaper. The storage is an adder on. Um, the beauty, and that's important to understand, you know, wind, for example, is very cheap, but you may have three weeks of no wind. How, how do you store that? You know, that, that becomes ridiculously expensive. The sun comes up every morning. Your iPhone will tell you exactly when. Um, there may be some clouds. Um, uh, because the technology is getting so cheap, you can overbuild it, so you can power the entire grid even with clouds. 
and then on sunny days you store the energy. You can do things like desalination. There's now plants to look into that. So the whole thinking is starting to change in the grid as opposed to how do I build enough generation to, to meet my load. It's like, I'll just build a lot of generation and then I figure out what kind of load can I all throw in there, like desalination. It's really cheap to store water, right? So, you know, whenever I have really sunny days and my load is very low, I just make a lot of fresh water. Cost is zero because um, for, the, for the energy, and that is the biggest cost today for a desalination plant, it's all about energy, um, is because I've overbuilt it for my grid. It's excess energy that I would normally just, just not use. Now I'm putting it to good use. Interestingly enough, sunshine countries usually water problems. Well, there's a perfect solution. So there's a lot of places where, where this comes in as a very important equation. How do I solve you know, the problem of providing clean, good drinking water? Not that big a problem in, in, in the US, um, but certainly a huge problem in Africa and in, in, in Central America, et cetera. So there's a lot of side benefits. This is just one little slide. I don't want to like uh, kick them, but a lot of folks love rooftop solar. They think distributed generation is wonderful and everybody should have a solar panel on their roof. It's like asking you to assemble your own iPhone at home. You know, you get a kit with 200 pieces and <laughs> it's just like, it doesn't make sense. You know, it, it's just very, very expensive. I can give you free solar panels and it'll cost you more to hire a guy to put them and install them on your roof. It's just ridiculously expensive to put a tiny little system. I mean, our power plants, um, we've developed the world's largest power plant. It's on 6,000 acres of land. It's eight miles long. Um, today, we power about a million people in San Diego. And by the time it'll be fully completed, it'll be two million people. The power plant that we're building right now, just north of Mojave, will power about a million people here in Los Angeles um, by the end of this year. Construction is going to be completed in, uh, in October. So that's a million people. Um, that's real numbers. That's real scale. And you can see that the cost of building a, a rooftop system also sometimes called distributed generation because it's you know all over the place. Um, it's all in the balance of system, in the roof retrofitting, installation costs, labor costs. The panels today are irrelevant. Five, ten years ago, that wasn't true. Panels were really expensive, and it you know didn't really matter where you put them. Today, it really does matter. Um, we we build about two megawatts per day right now up in Mojave. Two megawatts. That's 2,000 kilowatts. Your typical rooftop system is 4 to 10. We build 2,000 every day of that. Um, this is just cost of electricity, large distributed um, versus um, large scale power plants. This is economic impacts, obviously, you know, all this power plant technology we're building. It's a lot better than shipping money to, you know, to states that have coal or oil or gas. Um, stays at home, so to speak. Um, this is some of the pictures here of our power plants. Um, in the last seven years, we've now become the largest independent power plant developer. We focused only on one technology, only on one segment, and that is the large scale large-scale, what we call utility-scale power plants. For us, a small power plant is 300 <coughs> acres. That's a small power plant. Good-sized power plant is about 1,000 acres. That's a, that's a decent size. We have offices now in Brazil um, and in India, and just opening one in Bangladesh and in Singapore. Um, Projects. This is a picture of our Mount Signal solar farm. It's not completely built out yet. That is an Imperial Valley. For those of you who've ever been there, it's kind of like Mexico, except it's still part of the US. Um, it's El Centro, um, about 100 miles east of, east of San Diego. 
Um, great location, great place. You can see the border. You can see where the U.S. ends and then Mexico starts. Um, it's literally right on the border. Thanks to the federal government, we didn't have to pay for the fence on one side of our power plant. Uh, Redwood project, um, that's what it looks closer up. Springbok project, that's the one under construction, Mojave. Um, and these are really boring. I mean, the technology is really simple. It's just, you know, panels, panels, panels on, on trackers, little inverter houses. Our reliability is higher than a gas-fired power plant. Also something that people don't think about. They always say, like, well, you're intermittent because of, you know, the way the sun shines or doesn't. Our reliability, I can tell you on July 4th of this year, within 2% exactly how much power we will produce. Gas-fired power plant can't do that because if they have a turbine down for maintenance, they may lose 200 megawatts on their power plant. I may have an inverter blow up, I lose 1%. But I can predict the solar radiation within about 1% in the summer month. You know, spring when there's clouds, but the grid is at max capacity in the summer when all the air conditioners are running. So typically on cloudy days, the grid is pretty relaxed. That's it. I don't know how it did on time. Not too bad. So I was the director of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis for three years from 2009 to 2012. This is the institute uh, it's located in a castle south of, uh, south of Vienna, 14, 14 kilometers south of Vienna. And the institute um, has these three major themes. This is from our strategic plan that we developed. Uh, on the left is Peter Lemke from Germany, who was the chair of the uh, board of directors of the council, and myself. We developed a strategic plan that um, focuses on three major themes, energy and climate change, which is, of course, exactly what we're talking about here. Food and water, also related in many ways. I didn't really see the desalination connection, but I found that very fascinating. And equity and uh, inequality. So the, the, the part that I want to talk about very much complements your, your talk on the global scale. Uh, how are energy systems uh, evolving? And this is our report that was published in 2012, the Global Energy Assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, the director of the report was Nebuzhan Nakicenovic, who's uh, here, pictured here. Uh, you can download this report from the YASA website, uh, www.iiasa.org. AT dot e AC, no, AC dot AT, AC for academic and AT for Austria. Um, just as an aside, because uh, you were talking about predicting things. Uh, in, we had a, an energy assessment uh, at YASA in 1980, and we predicted not solar, but we predicted fracking. It was just a matter of price. And we knew that second, well, we called it secondary uh, recovery of oil and gas. And we knew that it would come. We didn't know whether it was in 20 years or 30 years, but it was, would come when the price curves uh, overlap. So you can make these predictions in the long term. And the Global Energy Assessment has done a whole bunch of uh, predictions. This is a prediction of uh, uh, glo uh, primary energy demand, supply, sorry, in uh, the United States, North America, and Canada for a high demand scenario. And this looks pretty ugly. This looks very ugly. This is kind of like, we let it all go and we'll supply it with whatever we can supply it with. We didn't consider the, well, there's a little bit of renewable up, up on top, the green stuff that includes the, uh, the PV. I would probably go back and ask my folks, why isn't this growing as fast as Dr. Buttgenbach? is telling it should go. And uh, I don't know if they would have an answer to that, but I will ask them that. Now, that, the next picture looks a little prettier, more renewables. And this is driven primarily by the uh, two degree Celsius uh, constraint of global climate change. And as you can see, if you compare these two, there's a huge amount of conservation built in. Now, the United States wastes a lot of energy. Um, we're we're pro per capita or per household, we're probably using twice the energy as a European household, certainly Japan. So uh, we're wasting a lot. So we can cut this by 30, 40% without any great sweat. And then we crank up renewables, which is the green part on top. 
maybe a little nuclear, gas and oil and coal will disappear. I mean, that we clearly agree on, that oil and coal will, will and should disappear. Here's the picture for the global primary energy, for the global energy assessment. Um, for up to 2008, we're still growing in coal, we're still growing in oil. You know, the one comment I would have, go to China. Go to China, sell them, sell them PV, because they're building coal plants like once, once, once every week or something like that. They need to transition for all sorts of reasons, not, not to mention pollution. So this is until 2008. Uh, this is a, a curve that shows that it is possible to supply the global energy demand for even a high demand scenario. If you put in a lot of solar in, that's on top, that's solar. Uh, renewables, uh, biomass at the bottom, a lot of CCS, carbon capture and storage, because you can't let the coal um, uh, co continue to emit carbon dioxide. And you see coal disappearing and you see oil disappearing and gas hangs in there for a while. Uh, again, this is a high, high demand scenario where you don't put too much restriction on growth uh, and, and, and demand. Uh, here is a more pleasant scenario where you go to the two degree C situation again. Again, on top you see solar now taking over a fairly significant share. And so the, the, the bottom line story is um, demand management is, is a big deal. You can get down by, by 30 percent. Uh, renewables, solar, biomass, wind can cont contribute a lot and we can get rid of coal and maybe even a good chunk of oil. Um, this is a curve that I wanted to show you uh, overlaying your cost curve, completely consistent with your cost curve. The yellow line is uh, photovoltaic price and I think this is per kilowatt installed, not kilowatt hour, going down by a factor of 15 over the last, uh, well, it's a, it's a, the x-axis is gigawatt installed, cumulative gigawatt installs, but so the more you install, the more you learn. This is called learning curves and very consistent with your story about uh, the reduced prices of producing uh, solar. And uh, interestingly, though, if you look at wind, it stays pretty flat. You know, there were some, some, uh, uh, some scale benefits from building larger windmills, but not a lot. Uh, and the most interesting thing to me is nuclear power, which is the red stuff, actually has been going up. So nuclear power, from a price perspective, isn't the answer. Uh, and if we extrapolate the yellow line, we're having exactly the story that you're telling us. The only quibble I have, and maybe this is not even a quibble, this is the other idea, and this is the solar heating systems uh, that are contemplating, particularly for the, for the Sahara, um, and there are two parts of that. I don't, I don't think this is photovoltaic. I think this is heating system, 10 square miles. This is newer, newer one, what eventually will be a 560 megawatt system in uh, Morocco. Uh, so kind of the scales that you're talking about, but a different system. Right? So the, if you know solar heating, it's essentially like working like a regular power plant, heating the water right, with solar panels, and then steam develops and you run steam engines, I suppose. And again, this other picture here on the right, that's the scale of land that you need in order to supply the world, which is the big square, uh, Europe, which is the medium square, and then Germany, which is the little square. So similar story, you know, the, the land, land requirements aren't all that huge, and in the Sahara, who cares, right? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Now, how do you get the electricity from there to Europe is a question, but, you know, the, the, um, there are companies that work on DC systems to trans transmit. And so the only other quibble I would have is, again, storage. I mean, if you add the five to six cents on top of the electricity production cost for, for solar, Storage can still be a bit of a, a bit of a problem, but otherwise I'm in violent agreement with my previous speaker. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. It's uh, always an honor to be able to share my perspective here at USC. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to uh, have been asked to provide the perspective from a political point of view. Uh, for me, that is, having served as senior advisor to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, uh, and, and what that means in relation to the solar growth of solar electricity and solar power in California, which then impacts the country and the world. 
Um, you know, we like to say at the Schwarzenegger Institute that public policy is always best formed when it's guided by facts and research and data. As we all know, unfortunately, very often in politics, facts and research and data are not the prevailing things that guide public policy. Um, and I'm going to share just some of those issues that come up. When Arnold became governor of California, fortunately we live in a state, uh, California, that has a long, long history of environmental leadership uh, in general and in energy efficiency and renewable energy in particular, and more recently in addressing climate change. Uh, the other thing that's fortunate about California is Arnold Schwarzenegger, while a Republican governor, uh, is not typical for what you see in Congress in the Republican Party in not wanting to address the growth of renewable energy or address climate change. But in California, that's never been true. When Ronald Reagan was governor, he passed the California Environmental Quality Act, and we've seen consistency in California's leadership on this issue. So the couple of things I want to bring out is like Arnold becomes governor and he says, what kinds of smart policies can we pass through the legislature that'll support the growth of renewable energy in California? Now this is separate from the fact that obviously the more we move off of fossil fuels and onto renewable energy, the more we're potentially able to address the concerns almost every major scientist in the world has about climate change and the impact of climate change. But even if, like, let's say you're arguing with someone that holds uh, views that, well, we don't believe in climate change, and you stack up a mile of scientific reports on it. If someone doesn't believe in it, you don't need to even address it as to why moving into developing renewable energy is just the smart way to go. So you don't even need to bother butting heads on that argument when you're looking at creating energy that can't be imported from the Middle East but is created here um, that creates jobs. And I want to say that because it's very important because those that are in politics nationally that are maybe saying, well, okay, maybe there is climate change, but we can't afford to create a laws that address it because it'll kill jobs in the economy. In California in the past six years, California has created more jobs in renewable energy in just the state of California than exist in coal in the entire United States. So this is a very important argument that Arnold used and Jerry Brown used that was made in Paris at the COP talks about how it, we are a living laboratory about how you can, by, with smart policies, address climate change in a way that supports economic growth and job growth. And that's a very important argument to make. So let's look at these large-scale solar uh, uh, projects that we saw Tom present and what his company is doing. And he recently said he got another contract with LADWP. In California, he also mentioned the Renewable Portfolio Standard. I'm going to go back to that because that's government policy that was put in place that allows companies like Tom's and other companies that are able to, to, to produce large-scale solar power for regions in our state and in the nation and in the world to come in and have a market to sell it to. So a governor comes in and he says, okay, we want to pass a law that, that creates a timeline and mandates the utilities throughout the state of California to say that by a certain date, 20% of all the electricity you're providing your customers must come from renewable. A few years later, 25% must. And then at another date, 50% of all electricity you're providing your customers must come from renewable sources. So a, a governor, smart leaders will sit down. They'll go, because everything's interconnected. So you know the research you're hearing about and battery technology and the chips of the, of the PVs. M much of that, even though Tesla and other private companies and Tom's company is doing some of that, a lot of that also happens at universities. And in California, we have some of the greatest research universities that are doing work in this area that are impacting the world than anywhere else on the planet. So some of that is, well, you know, we, do we say, ideally, we'd like 100% of all electricity to come from renewables. But can you pass a law and say in the next five, in five years from now, 100% will come from, well, if it's not at all possible, humanely possible, you can't do that. So you want to find out what is feasible, what companies are out there, where is the state of technology, and then push the envelope a little bit. So if it's feasible that maybe 15% can come, maybe you push it and say 20%, because then you're pushing the envelope. Now when that happens, so when smart policies are put in place like that, 
not just LADWP, but Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, 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 Southern California Edison, San Diego, every utility in the state is putting out bids for companies like Tom's to come forth and bid to get large-scale renewable energy projects. That creates market. That also it creates certainty, which is what the investment community, not just businesses like Tom, but what the investment community wants. So when a, a startup technology innovator that thinks they're going to create a better trip, a better battery story, t storage technology, so in the night time there really is a remarkable large-scale battery storage that's able of storing solar energy, that allows venture capitalists to have more certainty and private equity investors to have more certainty to invest in some of these innovative companies that are exploring these new technologies. So that's how it all interconnects with the research going on, whether it's in the private sector or at our great universities, with businesses like Tom uh, and with the market, is with smart policies get put in place. And the renewable portfolio standard in a major way has impacted companies like Tom's to be able to create markets, which then also, you hear cost, 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 brings the cost down. So a, a smart, it starts with a smart political leader. Like Tom says, in Texas, they're not looking at renewable portfolio standards because if, you, if you're a political leader that just wants to make sure that coal and oil and the traditional energy sources or that, you, that, you're, that, you're make, that your, your constituents or your special interests are making a lot of money off of, you're not going to want to change that. So it starts with making sure that uh, uh, visionary leaders that understand this, that come in to do the right thing, come in so that they put these smart policies in place, understanding how the market works and what's needed to achieve these goals. The one, so I also completely support the, what Tom said and the work he's doing. I will take slight issue with the rooftop solar part when he went into. Understandable as a large scale uh, solar person, you know, yeah. If, if we can, ha if every uh, utility, if we can get all, if every utility is providing renewable energy to its customers, we don't need individual homeowners or businesses to put solar panels on their rooftop. But when, when a governor like Arnold Schwarzenegger comes in and he's looking at the landscape and he's seeing that we're a long way from, let alone 100%, 50% of renewable energy coming from our utilities, he's trying to work, you know, you want to do everything that's possible to encourage more renewable energy, which of course makes the air quality better, impacts climate change, and uh, grows the solar industry, including spurs innovation. So. Uh, he put forth the Millions uh, Solar Roof Act, and that was also cost-based. So he sat down with uh, economists and business leaders that did a model to say, what would it take for new developments and homeowners to be able to make putting rooftop solar panels, because then it was very expensive and not competitive, putting rooftop solar panels on their home. So they, they came up with 50, a rebate of about 50% in year one of the cost of the rooftop solar system. Year two, 40%, year three, 30%, and then it goes away. W because the economic models show that after year three, that if you have that many more people buying solar panels, it will cr the scale alone will drive the cost down, and it worked. But on the political side of it, I just want to say how sometimes, whether it's passing a renewable portfolio standard or doing the million solar roofs, competing special interests that are at play with our legislators, right? So the million solar roofs all sounds fine. Why not give a rebate, help uh, offset the higher cost? And by the way, just so we all know, in the early days of the oil industry, a, a ton of, of federal ins dollars go to, ins to help support the growth of the oil industry, which they still get, by the way. So uh, there's long precedent when it's smart to support the growth of a new industry that's in the benefit of your citizens to do that. So the, uh, but in, in California, we all know, you've heard like there's powerful special interest, the gun lobby is a big special interest, the oil lobby is a big special interest. On the Democratic side in the state like California, the public employee unions are a big special interest. In California, there's about 1.6 million people are state, work for the state of California. An additional uh, 350,000 people are K through 12 public school teachers. That's, uh, that's another union in itself, and they have separate power. But I'm gonna talk about the public employee unions, and within there, 
the very powerful state engineering union. And because of their power, the leaders of the le in the legislature uh, count on their support to get elected or get reelected. And further, they count on their support to get elected within the legislature to be leaders. So Fabian Nunez, who was speaker of the assembly and an important leader, and a good guy and a friend and did a lot of forward thinking things, but was influenced by these uh, special interests, uh, was the youngest person to get elected speaker in the assembly. And in, when you're in a leadership position, as you all understand, there's a lot of power that goes with that. So even in, separate from getting elected in LA to the assembly, they helped lobby his Democratic caucus members to get him elected speaker of the assembly. So Arnold has him come down. Arnold had a, like a smoking tent, so he figures it was good for deal making in the courtyard at the Capitol, in the state Capitol, where he'd smoke cigars, he'd bring the leaders down. And I'm sitting there during the negotiation. And honest to God, Speaker Nunez had to go and say, can I use your phone, Governor, to call the head of this union to see how far he felt he could go, because he didn't want to you know, risk. They were very open about this in, in our political system. They, they, they want to do good, but they, all, they say, if we, if we don't get, if we're out of office, we can't do any good. That's their thinking on it. So what they want to do, again, here's what this union, this union, understandably, it's a democratic interest against a democratic interest. Public employee unions, wages and benefits versus environmentalists, two democratic constituencies within the same party. So the unions, their whole focus, the leadership of the unions, is really uh, good benefits and wages to their workers. So in California, the public employee unions, they try to keep passing what's called prevailing wage and benefits, which is a package of sal minimum salary and uh, uh, health and pension benefits. Obviously, good, you, I, I, whatever you think, even if you think it's, that's a good cause, let's get our workers better benefits and salary, um, and that's what they're supposed to do. But they use this as an opportunity to say, well, wait a second. If we're going to pass this, this is an opportunity now to extend these prevailing wage and benefits to even day workers that are working on any of these projects. Because if the state is going to give any rebate, it becomes a state project for the solar po uh, power. So we're going to say any worker in any part of that housing division that comes in, even if they're not working on the roof, even if they're not the solar panel installer, we're going to now increase. We're going to say that, that the, you're required to pay them prevailing wage and these benefits. Well, the economists modeled this whole rebate thing to make it affordable over the year one, year two, and year three. If you then add in the tremendously added cost of these prevailing wages and benefits, we're not saying cut anyone, but they wanted to increase it, to extend this. It would have made it not, not pencil out, and it wouldn't have been able to incentivize the homeowners to be able to come in, and the business model wouldn't have worked. It didn't go anywhere. Fortunately, because we have the Public Utilities Commission and they, they have their own power, Arnold then went to the Public Utilities Commission and th through a public goods call could charge, they were able to do a rebate program, at which point the following year, the Democratic legislature, wanting to look good to the environmental community, said, you know what, we're going to now make a law and codify what the PUC's done. And they, they then did add prevailing wage, but only to the people that were installing the solar panel, not to everyone that was working on that project. But that's the kind of, of politics you see. On the large scale solar, the other one final anecdote I'll give to show what you're up against. And again, sometimes it's within the same party competing uh, interests. So uh, Tom talks about, you know, the, the uh, Californians, we have the desert. We do. What a fabulous opportunity for solar panel, for solar power. But you've got to then build transmission lines to get that solar to the customers where they are and, and connect the, uh, the get, to get it into the grid. So in our desert, and of course we have the uh, CEQA and all these regulations and the process that you have to go through. So the, uh, in, in the desert where they had, s had slated one of the biggest projects, uh, there was a desert tortoise that was on the endangered species list. So the groups that had their whole focus is protecting endangered species, and good for them, that we want them to be doing that. But they came forward, because that's all they care about, and said, no, no, you can't build that here. 
So uh, these are th those are just a few of the examples I wanted to bring forth to show how even something that seems to make such sense, like you know when when Tom shows what a small area the sun could power the whole country, uh, you know even g getting the ability to build it in that small area to get the transmission lines and what you're up against with the regulations and the public comments and if it's an endangered species involved and uh, or, 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 or cost analysis, the different issues that could come up to potentially make it challenging to get there. Uh, but the, the, the good news is that, um, uh, that the, the cost has come down and it's uh, very promising, not just for continued economic and job growth in a place like California and proof to others that you can do it, but one of the most important uh, things we could do to, uh, uh, to reduce climate change. And, to, and, and the interconnected things is, the other thing you hear about is, uh, that Detloff brought up, is energy efficiency. Because what is your demand? I mean, if the utilities are having a supply to meet customers' demand, and, uh, and I have a great, and the demand is higher. So another, other, other bills that went into effect created that required all our appliances to be energy smart. Now you see when you go and buy it, it says Energy Star. So these are just some examples of how it's all interconnected and how smart government policies are so important to help support this kind of growth. I would like to know what, what type of storage uh, technology are you using now? This is a recent solar farms you're building. Um, we're using both lithium-ion battery technology as well as uh, flow batteries. Um, it, it's again, it comes down to cost, and and flow batteries are looking looking very promising in terms of driving the cost down for large-scale installation. For smaller ones, the lithium-ion is easier to handle. I, I did want to make one comment. Um, so first of all, I, I wasn't trying to knock the solar rooftop stuff, I think that played an incredibly important role in, in multiple areas. Number one, public awareness. Um, I think the fact that um, generally the population says solar is a good thing, we love it, um, is based on solar rooftop. It has nothing to do with our big power plants in the desert. Um, it's because people could see it, touch it, and, and it made sense. Um, so I think there was a tremendous educational value. Um, Second of all, um, at the time it was implemented, like you said, the cost was still very high. So it really helped the, the economy or the, 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 the industry grow. Um, Germany took a leadership there mm -hmm. um, with uh, feed-in tariffs and indirectly supporting it, and that created the big factories making panels, and then California stepped in. And so it was tremendously important. And lastly, Governor Schwarzenegger really was a visionary. I mean, it was amazing what he did for the environment in terms of actual tangible um, solutions. He implemented the, uh, the uh, renewable portfolio standard, and he then upped it once with an executive order because there were some issues. Um, your friend Nunez was probably talking to Mark Joseph um, <laughs> at the time. Um, um, why he didn't want to make it pass it as a law, but uh, but he did have an executive order to increase it to 33 um, percent. So really an environmentalist at heart, but also then turning it into real policy that helped the industry grow. We don't really need that as much anymore, which is a thing that policy should do. It should give birth, mm -hmm. but then kind of step away. And I think that's exactly what happened mm -hmm. in California. It really is a great role model. What about the solar heating systems? I, what, are you, what do you see the pros and cons between PV and solar heating? When you say solar heating, you mean concentrated yes. solar. Yes. Um, very simple. Uh, they just don't come down in cost. It's not a, you yes. know, today they're about a factor of two more expensive in terms of levelized cost of energy. Um, five years ago, they were on par. Ten years ago, they were cheaper. Yeah. Um, it's just they're getting killed by, by the chip. Yeah, so you blew through the duck curve. Slide. <laughs> and so, in, in, in dead. 2020 Sorry. or 2018, when we don't have infinity solar panels, talk to me about what this means for the duck curve and for ancillary services and things like that. Because I'm thinking you were using a 7% discount factor, and, and if we have increased prices because of duck curve, 
now. 7% discount factor, that's, that's going to matter, right? So what is this? Well, th this could be a very long discussion, so I'm, 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 I'm going to try to cut it very short. Um, um, the duck curve is a projection that was made on March 30th of a year, which is a very particular day because um, it's, it's spring, it's neither hot nor cold, um, the load is very low, the, but the solar radiation is actually pretty good. Um, so one could extrapolate that um, and say, gee, if everything linearly just continues the way it is, then we will have a huge overgeneration problem where we will just produce too much power from solar photovoltaics and then it suddenly drops off and we need to ramp up conventional energy sources at like, you know, call it 4 or 5 p.m. in the afternoon when the sun comes down um, and that ramp curve um, uh, is not manageable for conventional. Uh, give you an idea of a, a, an efficient gas-fired power plant takes several hours to spool up, basically, and come online. You can't just turn them on. Um, however, this is, you know, in my mind, it, it's a simplification that a lot of folks do. They, they kind of look at state of the art and then they extrapolate all the trends and say that's what the future will look like. Well, Southern California Edison, for example, today will pay you a premium if you orient it if you orient your rooftop system to the west. It'll produce less kilowatt hours, but they'll pay you a premium because it'll combat the duck curve because now you produce less in the morning but much more in the afternoon, so it'll soften the duck curve. Um, battery storage companies love the duck curve because you can make a lot of money out of storing power when there's overgeneration and then selling it in, in, into the afternoon. Um, also, industry will adjust. Today, um, the what's called time of delivery factors. I get paid not for a kilowatt hour, but for a kilowatt hour at a certain time of day. Those just shifted. Five years ago, I got paid based on conventional energy sources. Today, I get paid in the late afternoon a lot more that used to be during the daytime peak. Well, now everybody says, well, there's going to be a lot of solar, so you know, I'll pay you. So we start thinking about how do I optimize my power plant for these new TOD factors. So all of these economic drivers actually will take care of that. The simple extrapolation isn't going to be the fact because we react. We try to make more money. I orient my power plant slightly to the west. I make more money. I'll do that. So if you see it coming, you can duck. Yeah, I can talk. Um, so I, I think it's, this, is, this is the favorite slide of the fossil fuel industry to say, oh, if you just keep on going with those renewables, it's going to be a disaster. The grid will blow up. <laughs> well, Schwarzenegger had to fight a lot of that, where people said, oh, 33%, that's impossible. The grid cannot deal with that. It's too much renewable, blah, blah, blah. All turned out not to be true. As a solar company, I'm just wondering what policies or regulatory changes you would like to see, uh, either at the state level or the federal level, um, issues that you think could be resolved with better policy? Well, first of all, I'd like for the uh, clean power plan not to get killed. Um, Which? The one the Supreme Court, the Obama order. Mm. Yeah, um, that, that's a major tool to get at a federal level to get us moving in the right direction. Um, it's complicated plans. I'm not saying I even understand all the details of it. But generally, I think that that is a, a, a step in the right direction. Um, we would love to have a level playing field. Folks always say, you know, well, you get subsidies. And you know, for the large scale power plants, you don't get any subsidies other than the investment tax credit, which is a federal. 33%. But doesn't that sunset every few years? Um, yeah, and it, 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 it dies off um, down to 10% level by 2019. However, 
Oil and gas industry last year got $222 billion in subsidies. Right, with no sunset. Yeah, with no sunset. Um, they have massive limited partnerships, which... They should call it sunset. With the <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> massive limited partnerships are, are a significant <laughs> cost savings due to tax structuring you can do around MLPs that we can't do in renewable energy. So there's a lot of benefits that the fossil fuel industry gets. Um, and not to forget, our federal government makes a lot of money off oil and gas um, in royalties. So um, um, if we had a level playing field, um, we would be much better off in the long run. And right now, it's, it's, it's very tilted. Um, our lobby is a joke in terms of you know, our power. The oil and gas lobby, they got billions of dollars. I mean, we're... we're, we're barely a grassroots organization by comparison. But lastly, I think what our country really needs, um, we talk, touched on that a little bit, is kind of what Eisenhower did with the freeway system, where he said, you know, let's just build it because that infrastructure will pay off in spades because if you can start transporting goods efficiently, that grows the economy tremendously. We need to do the same and have policies for that in place um, to build more transmission. And the transmission needs to be focused on where it makes sense to bring renewables in. Solar from the south, wind from the north, northwest, um, and, and really build out a strong grid. Um, I had a discussion with a delegation from Brazil last night. The grid in Brazil is stronger than the grid in California. It's, it's scary. But our grid is, it's, it's, 40 years out of age. A lot of our infrastructure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But this is an infrastructure that is, in my opinion, you know, I'm slightly biased here. Uh, but it's really it comes right after bridges, right? Yeah. <laughs> it comes, it's really important to invest in because it's the solution. Well, unless you're in Flint and the pipes are your infrastructure issue and your you poison go. water, but it's yeah. all over the country, the infrastructure yeah. issue. So maybe kind of a big infrastructure policy direction. I, I think that would really help the country uh, move forward. The DC lines, Los Angeles has a DC line that goes into Utah. It's amazing what the technology will do. It's uh, one direct current. Yeah. Okay. That's um, 1% loss on a thousand kilometers, that's 600 miles. 1% loss. Mm. From that little transformer to your house, you're losing more power than they lose bringing it in from Utah to Los Angeles. So the technology is there. We can do it. But the real question I have is, well, yeah. um, good question. Uh, how much maintenance does one of these plants require once it's built, and how many jobs and how many people are you employing? Once you know, not in the construction phase, but in the maintenance and energy production phase. Okay. Um, eight-minute energy comes from it takes eight minutes for the sunlight to travel from the sun to the earth. After that, we'll take care of it. Um, how many jobs, um, what's the maintenance cost? Um, the good news and the bad news for jobs is that it takes very, very little maintenance. These panels have a life of about 35, 40 years. Um, our independent engineers will certify the life, the useful life to 35 years of a facility. You need to wash them once in a while. Once in a while you have a bad panel and you change it out. Um, we have less than 3% of our revenue in operation and maintenance expense. It's very low. That also means we have very few people there, which is why I can predict my cost for 30 years and sign a contract for 30 years, because I, I have very little surprises happening. So we employ, typically on a, on a good-sized facility, maybe a dozen people full-time. As we've come to the close, uh, close of time, can we give another uh, expression of gratitude to our speaker? At the